focusing purely on the topic of falls prevention, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some patient safety culture using some ideas from Charles Vincent, from John Berwick, and then a short amount of time on how we're still trying to find the balance as a national organisation. There's a few things I'm going to touch on. Julie will cover those in more depth, so if I speed through them, hopefully you'll hear and understand more later. And I won't make you listen to me for a full hour. We'll pause at a few points uh, and give you a chance to share a bit of wisdom with your neighbour. Uh, and where I've pointed out various articles or other things you might like to read, uh, I will share the links later on Twitter. You don't have to be on Twitter uh, to actually read those. You can just um, Google the words Twitter and my name and, and hopefully find some recent posts. Uh, so it's wonderful uh, to be here as part of a, a Tri-Nation approach. I'm not sure I'll be as exciting as the Tri-Nations tournament. Uh, I'm not sure I'll be as deadly as the Tri-Nations Wizarding Cup. Um, but I'm especially pleased to be on the New Zealand leg because this is actually where my nursing career started. This is me, age six, in a back garden in Nelson, being indoctrinated by my mother in my future career. So in talking about safety, probably important to say we've moved beyond the more narrow definitions you know, that have been in place since probably Florence Nightingale onwards, the first do no harm. <coughs> that was probably really important when we didn't have many healthcare treatments that could do any good. Uh, but we've moved into a rather more complicated world where for almost everything we do, there's benefits to our patients, there's also risks. Uh, and I'll be working within quite a broad definition of patient safety, uh, particularly focused on omissions as well as errors. And I'll certainly blur the boundaries a bit with wider boundaries of quality, effectiveness, patient experience, uh, and this little Q diagram uh, that I'll come back to in the end that puts that within a wider framework of leadership and sustainability. So... Uh, I've had a bit of a mixed bag as a career. I was a general nurse and a mental health nurse, which are two separate trainings in England, and that was my first culture clash. Uh, I was a manager as well as a nurse, and uh, those of us who've made that transition know that's a bit of another culture clash. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done traditional <coughs> RCTs and systematic reviews, uh, but also worked in quality improvement, which is a different mindset. I've done clinical effectiveness guidelines, had the privilege of being on working groups for those, uh, but also improvement guides, different slants to the same issue. Uh, and done traditional clinical audit whereby you've got set standards and you're seeing whether you reach them, uh, but also something we're doing more of which is called structured judgment, where we're accepting we have such complex patients that there is no rule book to follow for some of them. So if you're reviewing mortality or other areas, the only way you really know whether a patient had correct care is thinking about what was correct for them as an individual, uh, a rather different way of thinking to uh, a set menu. Uh, and I've been in a world where we thought we would learn a lot from one single high quality investigation, uh, and a world where we tried to look at a thousand or 500 incidents and see what the common issues were. And I guess, you know, that's kind of left me a little bit in the middle. Uh, I do like to see both sides, but it can be a bit of a culture clash. Uh, and a little bit more uh, reading about that if anyone is interested. Uh, but generally speaking, it's good to be eclectic. Uh, and because we all like things that confirm the way we were thinking in the first place, uh, I was delighted when uh, Charles Vincent and uh, his, his colleague, colleague Amal Berti uh, produced a book called Safer Healthcare Strategies for the Real World. It's free to download as an e-book. And they say we were all a little bit too rigid in the way we thought about safety and what worked. And I'll just talk through the three models that they use. And a lot of patient safety had moved towards copying the aviation industry, the nuclear industry, and was in a very ultra-safe, reliable mode. The sense that there was a correct way of doing things, 
you did it by the book and your improvement efforts were focused on making sure you did it the right way every single time, high reliability, same set procedures. That actually is a very good approach in some areas of healthcare. You know, if you're doing something like radiotherapy, you know, if you're doing some very set procedures, there is a book to follow and you want people to follow the book because that's the safest way to do it. Uh, but of course we also have more complex areas of healthcare. You know, we have people with trauma, distress, uh, at risk of self-harm with many, many personal factors going on there and quite what works for them uh, will be very individual to them as a person. You know, we have frail patients with multiple conditions, your know, list of diagnoses that go beyond the ability of our electronic records to list them all on occasions, uh, then with perhaps delirium on top. And for that kind of work, you know, that is really where you need a team who respects each other's efforts. No single person uh, can get the right care for them. We have to work together. But there's also an aspect to this model, just to mention, called ultra-adaptive or, or heroic, that there's some extreme situations, whether it's a, a gale for deep-sea fishermen, you know, whether it's something like uh, the crash on the Hudson Ridge River, where not one but two engines have been blocked and, and we're out of use. Um, or the example I used not only in New Zealand but elsewhere of healthcare after the Christchurch earthquake, you know, where you really do need extreme adaptation to very challenging conditions. <coughs> but Charles Vincent will say the problem is we have rather more heroes uh, who like heroic mode than we have situations that require them. So that's an interesting model to apply to FOR's risk assessment. And FOR's risk assessment, yeah, I, I tend to try and rule out as a word because we use to it to refer to two different things. Yeah, sometimes it means scores, FOR's risk prediction scores that come out in numbers or ranges. Uh, but also it can mean prompts that help you consider those risk factors that you can do something about. You, you can treat. Uh, you can ameliorate, you can manage a little bit better. Uh, and just to give you a, a sense of how those fit in, that scoring is very much in the ultra-safe mode. You, you calculate what the patient needs, you then apply a set menu. Whereas that approach of assessment being about what are the factors we can do something differently about for this individual is in this adaptive mode of safety. And uh, again, there's more you can read about this difference between scoring and assessment uh, with some links there if you'd like to read more. So I'm going to give you a little break um, from listening to me. What I would like you to do is turn to your neighbour, and I'm only going to give you a very, very short time. And between you and your neighbour, I want you to just do quick fire uh, for Miss A considering her time in hospital and considering when she goes home to her own home again, what risk factors are there that you can do something about? So obviously her age is a risk factor, but you cannot change her age, so I don't want you to mention her age. But anything you can get from that story where you might be able to give Miss A more independence, more strength, uh, less risk of falls, I'd like you just to quick fire with your neighbour um, once I say go, and keep a count, uh, use your fingers if you like, of how many factors you reach. So, ready, steady, turn to your neighbour, go. It's going to carry on like this, I'm afraid. Every time I stop you to let you talk about something, as soon as you start talking in, about something and getting into the flow, I'm going to stop you again. <laughs> um, but for now, um, I'm just going to ask you, this will sound complicated, but what I want you to do is each little team, whether you're a pair or three, I want you just to raise your hand because you're going to have to lower it in a minute. So everyone raise a hand, have one hand raiser. Now, if you found... Um, uh, less than five factors, would you put your hand down? If you found less than seven, hand down. Less than nine, hand down. 
Okay, so most of you found somewhere between seven and nine. A few of you were clever clogs and found even more, but we, we won't go that far. That was 60 seconds. You, so just think what you can do in your care environments or your clinical environments. And do you think you got more because you spoke to a colleague? So two morals of the story there. <laughs> The next model um, I'm going to explain to you is some slides that Don Berwick has recently started using. Don't worry that you can't actually read the screenshots of his slides because he's paraphrased things so succinctly and so neatly. Um, they're a little bit hard to follow, so I'm afraid I'm going to take liberties with it and write them out uh, in slightly longer text. But what he's saying here, and, and we're going to pick through this and use this as a bit of a structure for the next few minutes, is there's some past approaches, theories that really haven't been working uh, and Don's making some different proposals for the way forward in future. I, I'm going to be a little bit sacrilegious in places and I'm going to disagree with it Don, which for someone working in patient safety is um, sacrilege indeed, um, but mostly I'll agree with him, don't worry. So the first point he makes was one of the past approaches was we're not trying hard enough. Uh, we need to be set targets, we need to have punishment hanging over our head uh, in order to live a high quality care. You know, and his proposal for the way forward is, shouldn't be like that, we should see the challenges as a shared challenge. But it's um, a little bit tricky because sometimes in our history in England, sanctions probably did succeed a bit. These are reductions in MRSA over quite a long period, there's about uh, 15 years shown on that slide. Now, I don't think sanctions worked because we all work better under punishment, but it actually helped people invest. Now, typically in our hospitals now, you will have a large infection control team and probably a very tiny, if any, falls prevention team. Uh, but the very fact that having infections meant there would be a financial consequence did help investment. Uh, and the same was probably true for what's the purple line arrowed on this chart, uh, where knowing you would be fined for Clostridium difficile cases, even though that's not very motivating, again meant you could invest in the education, the training um, that reduced the use uh, of uh, some inappropriate antibiotics that have helped drive a, a very real change in what's a horrible condition that mainly affected the same frail older people who are vulnerable to falls. Equally, we've got many examples where sanctions failed. Uh, these, this is a run chart of surgical never events that you can see from the straight red and green lines is going absolutely bloody nowhere. Um, and that's probably because you know, what you need to fix is at a much higher level. You know, the symptom might be a swab left behind or a wrong site surgery, but this is actually about a much bigger problem of how people seriously implement safety advice. So the place the penalty is exercised is not the same place really you need to invest to improve, uh, so it failed. We definitely have some shared challenges and ours are not much different to yours. We have the wonderful achievement of many people living to be older. We have many more effective treatments that are expensive. We have rising expectations. We have a different sort of older people. You know, that the wartime generation is now the very, very old. Uh, we're not far off the early hippie generation <laughs> becoming our older people. Uh, and that will change expectations of healthcare without a doubt. And we have, um, I don't know if people have seen this, it's a study done of nurses in the UK talking about different aspirations, values in the different generations. I'm sure it would be very, very similar uh, for any other group of health professionals you, you took through this. And we need to understand our different values, our different motivations, because we aren't all the same. Uh, but it doesn't feel like a shared challenge. We had a very uh, bitter, tragic um, junior doctor strike. Uh, and I think one of the saddest remnants of that is not just that we've got distrust between government and the medical profession, 
but it turned into a little bit of a who's suffering most and it isn't good for healthcare professionals when you're all in a mindset that you have the worst deal and someone else is better off than you. So somehow we do have to get our own mindset back to you know, managing healthcare in economies with financial challenges you know, and multi-professionals, multi-generations is something we've got to work on together. So Don's other point is when we stopped punishing people, then we thought rewarding people would work. Uh, whereas he suggests really what, what we should go back to is our motivation isn't a financial <coughs> reward, it's pride and joy in the work. We do have a recent example of where rewards really did succeed. Uh, we have quite recently helped turn around antimicrobial prescribing. And again, perhaps that succeeded because what GPs really needed was to find some motivation for a bit more time. It takes time, it takes effort to talk a patient out of demanding antibiotics. You know, and the fact that there was also a financial reward for doing that, maybe that just made the difference. Um, I would like to think people would do it for pride and joy, um, but we have to be honest, that turnaround actually came when there was not just pride and joy, but there was uh, a financial reward for cutting antibiotic prescriptions. Uh, but we've had other situations where our rewards really didn't work. Uh, safety thermometer, first of all, we paid people for collecting data on pressure ulcers. Uh, then we presented a reward for cutting pressure ulcers by 50%. Uh, and as you can see, just about the time, in the middle of that chart, when the 50% target and reward came in, we seem to have cut them by 50%. Uh, the problem is, uh, when we actually did checks through uh, independent hospitals swapping their tissue viability nurses and checking skin, about 50% of pressure ulcers were missed. And this was not deliberate gaming, you know, this was just people getting confused, uh, if in doubt, counting it as something other than a pressure ulcer. Uh, and all this policy impact on what we were counting for, whether we were paying for it, whether we were rewarding it, whether we were pen penalising it, basically messed up what could have been a great quality improvement intervention. And we're now bringing it back full circle to say it's a local quality improvement tool, uh, not something to be used for rewards. But basically what Don recommends um, and what Don Abedian recommends uh, is love, uh, which is rather lovely. Uh, but I'm a cynical old nurse uh, and it's not always easy. And let's be honest, you know, uh, a lot of nursing tasks, therapy tasks, medical tasks, you know, are, are not always ones you can say you take joy in. Pride, perhaps, uh, but most things to do with bodily fluids, you would not use the word joy. So perhaps we just need more everyday thankfulness. Uh, there's some very good studies around learning from the best. Uh, and a beautiful phrase from Rebecca Lawton's work there, that we don't acknowledge when things go right often enough. I think all of us try harder to do that, you know, whether it is word clouds of feedback, whether it's counting your compliments more visibly than counting your complaints, you know, whether it's just that board you see in aged care facilities or hospitals where your thank you cards are displayed. They're important. They remind us of what we do. But it is a particular challenge for falls prevention, I think, because nobody thanks you for your patient not falling over. It's, it's an invisible achievement, isn't it? The next point Don makes is um, people turn to regulation, create rules, inspect, enforce. Uh, and his advice <coughs> is we need to turn more to principles rather than that kind of detail. Uh, and, and certainly we know regulation, detailed rule books can stifle. Uh, but I think a, a little bit of caution there. We have had experience of, not of the hospitals or trusts that people knew were a problem, um, but some, this example is Hinchinbrook, which was seen as a shining light until the inspection team went in and it wasn't a shining light. Uh, and I'm not mentioning Virginia Mason, you know, out of any uh, people love to see the mighty fall, you know, but the sense that even a hospital which is genuinely good and great and inspiring 
can find it slipped in a few things and inspectors can find that when they come in. So I'm a bit torn there. There clearly is some role for regulation and inspection. And our Care Quality Commission, which is our regulator and inspector, is very much trying to find its way, is trying to work more to principles uh, and less to detail, you know, more to leadership, uh, less to process. And if we as NHS Improvement get our role entirely right, we have the very important complementary role of helping the organisations that are found to be in trouble because it's one thing to be told you're failing or you're not good enough. It's a very different thing to actually get the help and support you need to turn around. Uh, and you'll hear a little bit more about how that's impacting on falls inspection from Julie. Next thing um, Don says is you know, the theory that measurement drives improvement, so measure more. Uh, <coughs> shifting to measurement informs improvement, perhaps we measure less. Now that is a bit music to my ears. You know, if we think a dashboard, a dashboard is meant to be something you can see at a glance, like an old cockpit in a plane or like uh, the controls in your car. I have seen dashboards that run to 111 pages. That is not a dashboard. I'm not sure quite what it is. Uh, and you see the green and red is blurring in my screenshots there to, to what I'm calling dashboard tartan. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some interesting academic studies that actually say we actually begin to fail on quality if we try and measure too much. You know, we lose sight of the important measures because we're trying to monitor everything. Uh, and two good articles there. Uh, one from a US and, and one from a UK perspective. So it's a bit tricky, um, but I think the lesson you can take from that is thinking how much time in any of your quality improvement are you spending on measurement as opposed to actually improvement effort? What is the right balance? You're, and I know QI colleagues are right when they say if you're not measuring, how will you know if you're improving? Uh, but there's also a Yorkshire phrase which says you can't fatten a pig by weighing it. Uh, and somehow we've got to find that happy medium. And um, does everything have to be measured? Now, Don tells an interesting story in which he says, you know, the one thing he's never measured but he can absolutely tell you uh, has got better over the years is his marriage. Now, I'd actually want a bit of corroborating evidence. I'd like Mrs. Berwick to, to also uh, say that. But as long as Mrs. Berwick said it too, I'd be pretty convinced. Uh, so I'm just going to ask you again to pause for a very quick conversation with your neighbour. Uh, think of an aspect of healthcare that you believe has improved since your career began. And that'll be easier for us oldies than for the youngsters in the room because we have more years to look back on. Um, and even though no one was measuring it, perhaps, at the beginning of your career, just have a little think and speak to your neighbour about how could you convince a reasonable judge and jury that improvement had occurred. Yeah. Over to you. Okay, and I'm going to stop you again. I said I'd keep doing this. Just every time you start an interesting conversation, I'm, I'm going to shut you down. So I'm just going to ask those, um, anyone who was convinced by their conversation partner's story, would you raise your hands? Yeah. yeah. So I'm not being totally sacrilegious here. You know, I do agree measurement's important, but, you know, sometimes we also can uh, celebrate success perhaps for something we didn't remember to measure right at the beginning. Another thing about measurement is uh, it's really important to know what's missing. Uh, this is some data from Forsafe, which again Julie will tell you more about. Uh, this is the monthly uh, reported falls. This is the monthly reported injuries. Uh, and these smooth lines are 12-month rolling figures that overcome some of the seasonal variation. Now, what we had... Um, about the point where the initiative was beginning was measured how many falls probably went unreported. We had to do it via staff surveys. And at that point, staff were only about 60% of them would swear the last fall they were aware of definitely got reported. 
Further on in the project, we had fewer reported falls, but we also had more people who were certain the last fall that had happened was reported. Uh, and it's a bit of a challenge, you know, we mostly have to choose between frequent data that might not be very complete or accurate, or accurate data that we can only collect occasionally or perhaps only collect on uh, injuries that definitely appear in the record, like fractured hips. So quite often people would talk about, is data good enough? Um, I'd change that question to you, do you know how good it is? Because you can't measure changes in quality if at the same time you're trying to improve data quality. Your care quality and your data quality will all get mixed up. Um, so one very useful thing you can do for any falls initiative is also make sure you're intermittently, even if it's only once or twice a year, uh, measuring how well falls are being recorded. Now, this is one where, don't be scared of statistics, we don't always need a statistician. Uh, this little run chart was one I ran myself, uh, having heard an esteemed uh, nursing director colleague talk about how her hospital had reduced falls by about 60%. Uh, and this is the monthly run chart of reported falls, so it runs from about... Um, the top of the scale is 80, the bottom of the scale is zero, and, and we've got one month there. So again, pause for a quick conversation with your neighbour. What do you think might explain this uh, extraordinary um, achievement in false elimination? Go. <laughs> So, um, at lunchtime, um, I will uh, listen to any interesting explanations uh, I hope you can give me, but I'll tell you the real answer for now. Uh, they introduced an electronic reporting system <laughs> and forgot to manage the password allocation, the training in how to use it for quite a while. If you're as interested in measurement as me, uh, there's a great, again, free book, Measurement and Monitoring of Safety by Charles Vincent, and I'll also recommend absolutely anything written by Mary Dixon Woods, uh, who is fascinating and very much into the human behaviour uh, behind measurement and interpretation of measurement. Uh, and if you're real gluttons for punishment, there is uh, a slide share whereby um, I explain some of the flaws in measurement using Spock and Kirk for another day. Um, the next point Don makes is past history was very much faith in better research, better systematic review, randomised control trials, uh, make research more rigorous and we will know what works to improve safety. Uh, and he proposes we should be much more into evaluating real-life interventions, more realistic evidence synthesis, uh, which, again, I'll, I'll mainly agree with, but um, I'll take the liberty of disagreeing with a, a little bit. Yeah, this is the kind of classic uh, NICE uh, or Cochrane uh, reviews uh, of evidence, um, and that looks relatively disappointing for what works in hospitals. This is um, an approach that's a little bit more realistic uh, synthesis, that it was saying, let's not just treat all multifactorial hospital interventions as the same. Let's look, was there something different about the ones that worked and the ones that didn't? Uh, so what you have at the end of the scale where there's more blue bars are the components uh, in trials that had an impact in reducing falls. And that tended to be multi-professional, having more than five components, including a post-fall review, doing something around toileting, something around med medication, making sure staff had the knowledge they needed, and so on. Um, whereas the other end were the trials that saw uh, no significant reduction in falls. Now, that's actually going back to joining up Don and Charles Vincent, that's an adaptive model. It's sort of saying there isn't a one-size-fits-all, but these are adaptive multifactorial interventions tailored to meet the needs of the individual older person. 
Whereas the other end was a little bit more the ultra safe type of studies where we have a set menu of interventions, we're applying them to everybody at risk. Uh, and that review we did some years back now. Uh, but if you look at the publication since, um, whether it's Full Safe that you'll hear more about from Julie, or whether it's the New Zealand experience, which many of you will know w about well and have been part of and will hear more about later, those are again the adaptive model. Um, the six-pack trial in Australia was more in the ultra-safe lines, you know, the sense of a set menu of interventions applied on the basis of a numerical risk score. Uh, but you know, it was brilliantly conducted. You know, its standards of research quality were extremely high, and if no one's listened to Anna present the results, it really is well worth listening to. Um, there's a recording of a conference presentation linked there. Because if that hadn't been done with the rigour of RCT, if that had been done just as a quality improvement study, I think we'd all go on believing whatever we wanted to believe, rather than have a, a really high quality trial demonstrate that that more rigid approach didn't actually produce a reduction in falls. Another example of where it gets quite problematic to pull the evidence together is bed rails. You know, it's a bit of a muddly picture. I wouldn't take you through all of that uh, green print chart. You could read more about it if you wanted. It's, again, a, an open access article. If you just look at them in a classic systematic review way, it's all a bit confusing. But if you look at the detail, there was a difference between those who were evangelically trying to eliminate bed rails um, and the C study is the classic, you had to fall out of bed three times before you were allowed to have your bed rails back, which seems a little excessive um, in the scheme of things. Um, and bringing those together, you know, there's a sense of too many bed rails are a bad thing, too few, especially if you're evangelical about taking them away from people who like them and want them, is also a bad thing. Uh, and that's why we came up with these kind of models, which perhaps work at Don's principles level. They give you some steer for how you'd advise a patient uh, who could make their own decisions, or how you could make a best interest decision uh, for patients who, who are not able to protect themselves. Uh, but life is actually often a little bit more messy. Um, so I give you Mrs. Green, um, who technically, if you're following our own guidance, the little chart that I just showed um, would probably come under one of those patients for whom bed rails are not recommended. But, um, uh, and I've just, uh, I've given her two names though, it's definitely Mrs. Green all the way through. I've made a typo there where she's Mrs. Black later. This was a part of a, a set of six teaching examples. Yeah, but her husband knows her really well as well. So, pause again for a quick conversation with your neighbour. What would you do for, let's call her Mrs Green, she's definitely Mrs Green, not Mrs Black, uh, given her, her husband's concerns, the pattern of what's happened, what, what would you do? Go. <laughs> Um, whatever you did, you probably didn't follow the rule book. Whatever you decided to do, you were going to try something and see how it worked. Would that be fair to say? Adaptive model. Common sense. Um, patients don't always fit the rule book. And whatever principles we have, we need professional judgment, professional skills, uh, listening skills to know when to work around them. Uh, and just to mention while we're on bed rails, um, technical safety is incredibly important. It's almost been eliminated in hospital settings because we tend to buy beds, bed rails, mattresses as a single package now, so they work together. The manufacturers <coughs> take care of the safety. Um, but we still have some tragic cases, particularly in care homes, aged care facilities, where there's perhaps a combination of a, a domestic bed a bed rail brought in when someone's frailer that creates fatal entrapment gaps. Uh, and the one risk we still have in hospitals is um, 
the young man there was, was a disabled adult who was actually child-sized. And even our safe beds are only meant to be safe for people within a normal range of adult size. So if you put a child-sized adult even in a safe bed, you can create uh, a fatal entrapment gap. So, um, done again. Uh, past approaches, technology will solve all our problems. Uh, his proposed way forward, people will solve all our problems, but sometimes technology helps them a bit. Um, I love this. Uh, I once tricked people to come to a presentation on a WebEx by calling it Technology for Falls Prevention. Uh, and then showed them a picture of a red biro to cross out medication uh, and a cup of tea <laughs> to sit down and talk to your patient and hydrate them at the same time. Um, so I'm a bit of a dinosaur here. Uh, and you might find it interesting when Julie talks later about uh, postural hypertension. It's actually the old-fashioned equipment we need. The, the newfangled equipment uh, is leading us astray. Um, but what we have learned is that changing equipment is a very, very challenging task. And as you change one piece of equipment to solve one problem, you get knock-on effects. Uh, this is Wayne Jowett, uh, who died uh, over 17 years now from fatal injection of vincristine uh, accidentally in the spine uh, because we used Lure or Lure Lock uh, syringes at the time. Um, we have spent uh, many years, 10 years, uh, between the first alert shown on that page and the last, in trying to drive changes in that design. Uh, and we're only just now getting there. And we've only been able to get there because the whole world needs to get there. You cannot anymore, as one country, change equipment uh, and expect it to carry through. Uh, we created quite a lot of additional problems along the way, uh, more um, than you would want me to list. But, you know, any complex change has other effects, creates other problems, uh, and that's something well worth remembering. Even good technology needs very careful introduction if it's to have all of its benefits and fewer of its risks. And, you know, it's what we do with technology, isn't it? You know, this is a movement alarm, and this is a, a genuine comment I overheard and wept at at a Falls conference. And we had to issue advice on ultra-low beds when they were being misused um, to restrain patients to stop people from getting up and walking. Yep. And it's not always the exciting med tech technology. You know, things like just the improvements we've had in toilets and lighting, automatic lighting, that comes on gradually, things like this are a great boon. So I'm not being a total technology phobe here, uh, but um, it can be uh, a double-edged sword. If you looked at that toilet seat, though, for a man that blocks that, <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. And there's uh, the one bit they have grasped there is there's somewhere for a bloke to hand on to, <laughs> hang on to when they're standing yeah, right. up to pee. But, but there are some extra bits for them to uh, miss. Too right. When Don's talking, um, he'll say about the past approach being clinical leadership was the key. I, I always worry, but especially uh, American speakers who talk about clinical leadership, it seems most of the time they mean medical leadership, and, and that's good. But you know, if we're talking about clinical leadership, we really should mean leadership from all clinicians. Um, but none of us would argue with this new way, which is we need the team, the whole team. And the team, of course, is not just the healthcare staff, um, but it is uh, very much the approach that you see in all the approaches you'll be hearing about today. Uh, I do just want to point out that um, New South Wales hasn't conformed to the green colour guide. We managed to achieve the same colour green uh, in England, in New Zealand, and you've picked a different <laughs> shade there just to spoil the slide. But you'll be hearing constantly about multidisciplinary approaches as one would expect from all our tri-nations. And the whole teams are not just uh, the clinicians, uh, the support staff, the family, Vanu uh, and friends. I just want to ask who's in the room today, and, and you can put your hand up multiple times. Um, would you put your hand up if you're an allied health professional, physio, OT, pharmacist? Yeah? 
Um, put your hands up if you're a nurse. Put your hands up if you're a doctor. Put your hands or oh, lonely but welcome. <laughs> uh, put your hands up if um, you have ever been a patient. Put your hands up if you have ever been a carer to someone you love as a friend or family. Uh, put your hands up if you're a manager. Put your hands up uh, if you're anyone I failed to uh, point out so far. <laughs> and uh, welcome members of the team too. Um, I want you again just to pause for a very brief conversation with your neighbour. You're only going to get one minute and you need half of it each. Um, but I want you to tell each other about a time you learned something to do that you use in force prevention from someone not of your background, not of your discipline, whether that's a, a professional uh, colleague or whether it's a patient or whether it's their family, Vanu or, or whoever. Go. So clearly that was a very easy thing to do for all of you. I saw no pauses. Everyone perhaps had too many examples to choose from. Um, and maybe what we've done there is demonstrate a little bit of that everyday thankfulness. Um, so if the person you were talking about is still someone you're in contact with, perhaps remember to tell them uh, that that's something you're grateful for. Last thing from Don is uh, the past approaches was getting a bit assertive about requiring spread. You know, it worked for them. Don't reinvent the wheel, just bloody get on with it. Um, whereas Don will say, own and adapt. Uh, there's very strong reasons for that need for ownership and adaptation. We all know Cochrane as, as a library, as an evidence source. I don't know how many people know it was named after Archie Cochrane, uh, who is a fascinating uh, kind uh, and gentle man, and, and the story I'm taking is from his autobiography. Uh, but he talks about when he was a doctor in the late 50s, early 60s, coronary care units had just been invented, so it was an alternative to basically your treatment in the past for a heart attack would have been tuck you up in bed at home, bed rest. Uh, the newly invented coronary care units tucked you up in bed, bed rest, um, but also hooked you up to a monitor, maybe did a few more things. And he did a randomised controlled trial between patients <coughs> treated at home and treated in coronary care units. And the results at that stage found a small numerical advantage for those who've been treated at home, completely insignificant in statistical terms. He rather wickedly compiled two reports mm -hmm one reversing the number of deaths in the two sides of the trial. And as he was going into his research scrutiny committee in the waiting room, he showed some cardiologists the results, the switched results, not the true results. And they were vociferous in their abuse. <coughs> Archie, they said, we always thought you were unethical. You must stop the trial at once. Mm -hmm. I let them have their say for some time and then apologized and gave them the true results challenging them to say, as vehemently, that coronary care units should be stopped immediately. There was dead, I suspect rather painful, silence. Uh, and he felt rather guilty because they were, after all, his colleagues. What he is giving there is a brilliant example of cognitive dissonance. We have a really strong need for what we believe and what we do to match. And we feel very uncomfortable when we don't. The discomfort we feel is called cognitive dissonance. It's usually a force for good. And this is why creating our own wheel is really important, because we then move heaven and earth to make that wheel turn. That's why reinventing the wheel is sometimes far more successful than adopting someone else's. It can be a negative. Yeah, if we believe, and we're right to believe, we're part of a really good, strong team, and we've done something that ought to have worked, it's very hard to believe we haven't really achieved improvements or that we might be less safe than peers. And, and that's the downside of cognitive dissonance. 
uh, and another link uh, where you can read some more. We have um, that challenge in how we spread. So it's a very good study using what's described as an ED checklist, but perhaps might be better called a core care plan. Uh, particularly helpful for staff who are brought into emergency departments in crisis situations to manage to do the essentials of care well. Yeah, that was done and successful in one trust in 2014. Uh, where we're at now is we have another six trusts in 2017 have just finished uh, a year's exercise in spread. And understandably, because we will have a winter crisis again, we have a summer crisis and then we have an extra winter crisis in the NHS every year. There's great enthusiasm for saying, well, it's worked in seven trusts now, just make everybody use it. Uh, but you're very unlikely to get the same benefits. The benefit is not the checklist in itself. The benefit is probably the journey those trusts went on in making it their own, uh, using it as something to hang other improvement efforts around. And the last thing I said I'd try and cover wasn't uh, Charles's words or, or Don's, but how we as a national patient safety team are still trying to find the balance. We get lots of chances to reinvent ourselves. Uh, I can't quite remember what umbrella I was under the last time I came over to New Zealand, but we've been the National Patient Safety Agency, the NHS Commissioning Board. We were in NHS England and we're now in NHS Improvement, which is probably the best name, at least, of all the organisations uh, I've belonged to in the recent past. And that gives you a chance to reflect, to think about what you did well, uh, and to try and find a happy medium. We've learned to be very mindful of the size of the challenge. Uh, something like falls prevention is complex. If it's common, it must be a wicked problem, something that needs long-term focus via quality improvement initiatives. We do have some issues on a more manageable scale where we can make progress in months with extra support and resources. Uh, and we have a special role related to our national reporting system that what we find that's rare um, but could recur is something that the national reporting system is uniquely placed to detect. And sometimes action on that is possible within weeks. And we try to keep the balance between most safety issues do need systematic action. We don't necessarily need an alert even to be seen by frontline staff. Uh, the example there is making sure that staff have the right equipment and skills to retrieve a patient who is fractured in a hospital, because our ambulance services have that equipment, but in the past hospitals didn't. Uh, and we would tend to panic and get people up off the floor without really thinking it through. Now, if you sort that equipment and training, the fact that our alert triggered that change really doesn't matter whether or not frontline staff saw it. We want to design out the error wherever that's feasible. Uh, there's an example I'll show you in a moment related to uh, confusing airflow meters and oxygen flow meters. Yeah. It's much easier to make it impossible for staff to make a mistake, but it's not always easy to find ways to design out error. You know, it's far easier with equipment than it is with more human aspects of healthcare. And we do try and keep in mind the, the type of error, because sometimes alerts are treated as though they're a lesson in a page. Uh, and this one on response to button batteries in a way was, but most errors are not related to a knowledge gap, and reading one page of an alert is not necessarily the same uh, as recalling new information when you need it. One of the balances we've found is create and ask why videos, so we'll issue an alert and at the time when an organisation should have changed practice, should have helped its staff do the right thing, we'll later issue a short video uh, encouraging staff to ask why. In hospitals, connections to medical air and oxygen supplies have traditionally appeared side by side. As air and oxygen flow meters look similar, it can be difficult to tell them apart. And as they both have universal outlets, oxygen tubing can be attached to both. If oxygen tubing is connected to the medical air flow meter in error, this can cause harm to the patient. In the last three years, the National Reporting and Learning System has received two reports of fatalities, two of severe harm, and over 200 
low or no harm incidents caused by this error. This patient safety alert asks that three distinct barriers are put in place. One, use designated caps to cover all medical air units in areas of hospitals where they are not used. For example, if nebulizers driven by piped medical air are no longer in use. Two, when medical air flow meters are not in active use, remove them from wall outlets and store them in allocated locations. Three, fit labeled, movable flaps to all medical air flow meters. By putting all three of these barriers in place, the risk of this error should be eliminated. The deadline for implementing the actions required in this alert is the 4th of July 2017. If your organisation has not made the necessary changes by that date, you are encouraged to speak to your manager and ask why. So we're still trying to find that balance, but that's one way of um, trying to ensure the focus is between responsibilities from leaders, uh, but also that follow-up, that extra initiative from frontline staff. Francis, can I just ask, that sounded like it was a compulsory change. So is there legislation to say that that change can be enforced and followed up on? Yeah, so um, we're not like a health and safety executive in that when we issue an alert it isn't law, but when we're issuing a specific technical fix, um, it's called a directive, uh, and the sense there is, yes, if you're providing NHS-funded care, that the contract for NHS-funded care would say you are required to uh, comply with safety advice from designated bodies. Um, so yeah, it, that, it's rare for us to do it, but it isn't meant to be optional. doesn't mean it always happens, hence the belt and braces of trying to get frontline staff to say, why hasn't this well, happened? The CEO would have to have a pretty good reason. Mm. A absolutely. And of course, that's a beautifully easy thing for inspectors to uh, check out as well. They've only got to look at the wall. Last couple of minutes. I'm just saying, you know, we've also learnt not to fall into solutionitis. You know, there may be a checklist manifesto, but checklists are only really good for the type of error that are called slips and lapses. You know, if we have uh, routine violations, if we have people breaking a rule repeatedly, it's not usually because they're bad people. We may need to address that with campaigns, but a campaign won't fix a knowledge-based error. We may need education. Um, so that sense of really understanding, uh, of course, underlying causes, but also having that error wisdom of, of what type of error has led to this problem uh, is helpful in how we take forward uh, solutions that match the error type. And you're going to hear more about real education, both from Julie uh, for hospital staff, uh, nurses and doctors, and from Lorraine for older people. Uh, but we've also learned we need to produce a different type of education, which I'll call teaching ignorance. Yeah, I think everyone's seen the Rumsfeld quote. Uh, but in safety terms, this is the really dangerous bit. If we don't know what we don't know, that is when our patients come to harm. If we can just shift that to knowing what we don't know, we actually have safer practitioners. Uh, and there's another example of a video we've done, which I'm not going to show you today, which aims to teach people they do not know what the four criteria for nasogastric tube interpretation are. And as long as after that two-minute video, they then know that they don't know how to interpret a chest X-ray, we have far safer patients. So, to close, uh, I'm bringing back my cue slide. Uh, as you hear your other speakers today, of course you'll hear about safety, of course you'll hear about high-quality person-centred care. Um, you're also going to be reflecting on whether it's effective, whether it's evidence-based, whether it's creating a good experience for the patient. Um, I'd ask you also to take away thinking about, are you doing things that are not good use of money? You know, if you come away from today with ideas of things you want to do more of, is there also ideas of things you can do less of because they're not effective, uh, they may not be achieving what your patients want. Uh, and this is undoubtedly overall about leadership, and you are the leaders in the room. 
I talked about cognitive dissonance. You know, one of the things cognitive dissonance does to you is when someone comes up with a new piece of research and it says exactly what you already believed, you really like that research. Uh, and I really like this bit of research, which says the most important trait for career success, for life success, for leadership, uh, is conscientiousness. Uh, and that's something um, that for force prevention I can find many, many uh, values to. So, Nana Hay, uh, more information on Twitter. Thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> <laughs>